The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. I'll let you know we'll probably have two quizzes next week. I want to give you a very simple quiz that I used to give every year in 914, in which you simply list the cranial nerves, uh, their names, the number, the name, whether they're sensory, motor, or both. Uh, there's a table, I believe, in the book. And so let me look at that and we'll... We'll send an email around about that. I think it's very useful to know. It's just one of those outlines that uh, you need to have in your mind. So when you encounter it. Yeah, I learned a little uh, uh, mnemonic. I think I give it in the book. Uh, I just memorized the mnemonic and then I had no trouble because, you know, you hear those names enough. Easy enough to learn it. All right, so auditory system. And, uh, we had ended by talking a little bit about coding of frequency and intensity in the auditory nerve, and then how it's the spatial map of the basilar membrane is preserved in the uh, organization of the accents coming into the uh, to the cochlear nuclei here. And uh, I want to uh, just review the sensory channels, what happens to that information that comes in through the eighth nerve, the auditory component of the eighth nerve. We're not going to talk much about vestibular uh, but if you learn the auditory system, vestibular is not that different. Uh, it's less studied, but the hindbrain mechanisms are studied the most because they're important in some human uh, problems. So, and, and of course, to neurologists, dizziness is a common complaint that people have, and he has to understand something about that system. But then we want to get to studying the two, two major ascending pathways. You can divide, in the auditory system, you can divide ascending pathways pretty early on into pathways more concerned with identifying patterns, generally temporal patterns of the stimulus, and they keep frequency separated all the way up to the auditory cortex. And then pathways concerned with localization in space, and the kind of cues used for that. So so this is the system that you gradually come to understand more and more as we go through this. So uh, these are the basic channels. We talk about a reflex channel, just short pathways that begin in the cochlear nuclei, mostly ventral cochlear nucleus, and uh, but both of the cochlear nuclei that just project to brainstem neurons that have pretty short reflex connections. And startle is just one of them. And then the cerebellar pathways, which could be considered a type of lemniscal channel. You see it uh, here. I show a pathway from the dorsal cochlear nucleus, as well as to a reflex. And, uh, and then the lemniscal channels. There's two major routes from to the inferior colliculus, two separate routes, and the inferior colliculus projects heavily to the thalamus, the medial geniculate body. Medial, because it's in the human, it's, it's another bump, a geniculate structure that's medial to the lateral one. The, the visual input comes in from the retina. There is a smaller root that's more prominent in the, the, uh, the large mammals. It was actually discovered first in the chimp, but then they looked with more sensitive methods and they realized it's even there in the rat. 
uh, a pathway directly from the dorsal cochlear nucleus to the medial genital body. But then there's a, a root that we think may be older, but it is here in gray. I show it coming from the trapezoid body primarily, uh, which gets its input. It's n many neurons in the trapezoid body region here, which contains a lot of crossing fibers related to the auditory system. That travels through the reticular formation, also to these nuclei of the lateral and meniscus. But the axons continue forward through the midbrain. Some of them go into the spirit folliculus. They don't terminate in the main nucleus of the medial geniculus. They terminate in cells around it, including many cells that are multimodal. But some of them are also, are, there are unimodal regions too. It's just called part of the posterior group of nuclei, but it includes a nucleus that's called the medial nucleus of the medial geniculus body. All right, so I just want to say a little more about the eighth nerve. These, you know that axons representing different frequency terminate in this organized way in the two nuclei. The nerve comes in from below, and then the, a similar thing happens in the ventral cochlear nuclei, anterior and posterior divisions, and in the dorsal cochlear nucleus, where Axons from different parts of the basilar membrane, different parts of the cochlea, terminate at different levels. So if you penetrate this this way, you, you have a nice, you see the representation of frequency. Now, if you look at one of these axons, okay, it, it goes from rostra, it, it travels rostra, uh, rostra caudally through the nucleus. As it tra this is the, all the branches. One of these, this would be like those rostral caudal axons that I just showed you okay, along here. But what they're showing in this picture, this is from originally from Nelson Kang here at MIT, who still comes to talks here. We met him just the other day. He's, uh, he did a lot of this work on the eighth nerve. And what he's showing in this picture is different cell types in the ventral cochlear nucleus. And he investigated... Uh, how these respond uh, to different to a pulse uh, of sound graphed here. Okay, uh, this is the tone burst, uh, and here's how the eighth nerve axon responds. A lot of the action potential is right at the beginning, and then it levels off at a lower level. And you'll note here, if you look at the responses of these cells, there's uh, one type that pretty much matches this. They call it a primary-like postsynaptic uh, uh, train of uh, action potentials. So my question is, you know, how do you, how can that happen? Because normally in no matter where you are in the central nervous system, cells don't fire when there's only one action potential. There's got to be a lot of summation. Either it's ready to fire because there's a lot of other excitatory input coming in, uh, uh, there's also some spontaneous activity. And if it's near the point where it's going to fire anyway, and you get, it might fire a little earlier if there's input. But how does this happen reliably? And why is reliability so important for those neurons? It's important because it's used as a cue to position in space because the input from the two ears is compared. So you want to, and I talk about the chick system because it's a little simpler than the mammal. Okay, and it's been easier to study. So the studies are, are better for the chick than they are for the mammal. So you've got to know what the end bulb of hell is. These are endings of eighth nerve axons on some of these cells. Okay, cells like this. Okay, the spherical bushy cell. But in the chick, they're just bald cells. During development, they had a lot of dendrites. They pulled them all in with development. 
And this terminal distributes over the cell like a cup. Okay? There's a similar ending in the trapezoid body that's called the calyx of hell. They were both described by this anatomist held. Uh, I used to call it the calyx of hell in the cochlear nucleus, but then I read the history and realized that he actually he, he described the one in the trapezoid body. He also described this one, but didn't call it a calyx. So people call it the end bulb of hell. But you can see what's happening here. It forms multiple synapses. So many different synapses in one bouton. Okay, one in large, terminal enlargement. That means with the action potential, one pulse here arrives. It causes simultaneous depolarization at many different points in that membrane. So they all summate here at the axon hilly, and you end up with one action potential coming out. Okay, not pretty unusual in the central nervous system. Okay, so these are those, just another summary of these uh, connections to the thalamus. And we want to, uh, these are the summary of the thalamic projections then. Uh, of course, the mediogenic body projects to the auditory cortex and the temporal lobe. Uh, you also get projections to nearby areas from those posterior nuclei that are getting auditory input. That's why when I diagram this this way, I show that these neurons outside of the principal nucleus in the nuclear body, I show them going to area 41, whereas these other cells go primarily to the other areas especially the areas ventral to auditory cortex, which also get transported connections from auditory cortex. Okay, so this just to remember that cells here, let's put it in blue, cells here in the medial genicular body send axons that go not only to neocortex, but also into the amygdala, the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. And I mentioned there are some visual projections like that, too, to that lateral nucleus, the amygdala. And that's proved to be pretty important when we learn fear. And the studies primarily of the rat. Okay. So, this is... what we just looked at. And I think I've just answered this question. Why do some of the auditory nerve axons that terminate in the ventricular nucleus end in a giant terminal enlargement? To answer that, you have to describe that, that end bulb of hell. What function does it serve? Okay, if you get enough spatial summation. So one act potential results in one output. Then you need to know what the trapezoid body is. Well, you don't in, in pictures like like this. I just show it is down here. But if we if you looked at a cross section, I really should have a mammalian cross section here, but they're easy to find. You find that the cells here in the especially the ventral cochlear nucleus project to both sides into cell groups in the trapezoid body. There's a medial nucleus of the trapezoid body, lateral nucleus of the trapezoid body. Okay? And, uh, and there you have, in, in mammals, there's, there are, there's another, this big calyx of held that preserves that one-on-one -on -one, uh, response to auditory input. Uh, in generating the location information. But let's look at it in the chick. Where coincidence detectors is a good good term for it. I created this table because some people 
have a terrible time if they only see the drawings. They've got to have it all spelled out in words, so I created the table. Uh, so all I'm doing here is putting words to those pictures uh, that we've already gone over. Okay. So now we'll, we'll follow the pathways involved in these two functions. We'll begin with the sound localization, which involves that precise timing we were just talking about. The pathway that generating these differences depending on where, where the sound is coming from in the azimuthal plane. Uh, one of the major outputs is to the sphere colliculus where you have a map of the auditory world. Okay, the spatial map. That is, neurons respond best to sounds coming from a certain position in space. And that position in space matches the area where the visual input is also triggering. In a, in a more, you know, up closer to the surface. The auditory input's coming in to the middle layers of the corpus. Some metasensory input's coming in to the deeper layers, gen most of them below the auditory. Okay? And there you get a spatial map too. Think of the coverage of the field around the animal's head by those enormous whiskers, the mustachial vibrissi of rodents. They protrude out into the visual field. So yeah, you're only dealing with the space right next to the head, but that still matches the things they see beyond that whisker. So they can anticipate something coming at them. They can anticipate a stimulus in the whisker that's located in the same area. Okay, and then when we deal with pattern identification, that pathway from the dorsal cochlear nucleus goes directly to the thalamus. Uh, also by way of the inferior colliculus, but some of them go directly and then to the end brain. And most of the analysis of temporal patterns happens in the cortex. Okay. So for location, I have here the eighth nerve. You go to the ventral cochlear nucleus. Uh, and uh, these are the structures of the trapezoid body. Sorry, sphere olive. And that's where you get neurons projecting to a number of places, including the cerebellum, even though the cerebellum does get some direct input too. Okay. And then from there you go to the nuclei, the lateral meniscus, and inferior colliculus, as you see, and the superior colliculus, which itself, as we know, has projections into the lateral valve. Okay. So in mammals, it's the medial superior olive, which is sensitive to precise time of arrival. But that's just representing azimuthal position. I mean, the timing doesn't actually help the animal discriminate sounds above the horizontal plane or below. They need other ways to do that. It's not as accurate, but by simple head movements, they can generate cues. And uh, because of the shape of the pinny, uh, the pinny attenuate different sound frequencies differently according to elevation. So the sounds actually has a slightly different effect on different neurons. And that is used in localization in the vertical plane. It's been studied in owls where just the configuration of the feathers around the ears create those differences. I don't know as much about that. It's not been as well studied. But we do know that they, there is a map of in the vertical dimension as well as in the azimuthal direction. So let me go through those studies in chicken, okay? Uh, we talked about this end bulb. That is here in this diagram of one neuron type on both sides in the uh, cochlear nucleus of the chicken. So here's the accent coming in from the organ of Corky in the cochlea on the left side and then on the right side. Here's the end bulb of held. So we know 
any every potential every action potential coming in here leads to one here. And note that these neurons have two projections. They branch. One goes to this nucleus laminaris. Obvious why it gets that name because of its appearance. And then the other branch goes to the it goes this way. Goes to the ventral dendrites of laminaris on the other side. So this side it projects to the dorsal dendrites. The one going to the other side projects to the ventral dendrites. These cells will fire only if they get nearly simultaneous arrival of potentials from the two ears, from the two sides, from that cell type. of nucleus magnus cellularis uh, on both left and right sides. And I've noticed when I, I've looked at the pictures in Golgi uh, in a study of the chick uh, by, this was DeVere and Morest at, at Harvard. They studied the development of this system including the development of these big end bulbs but they also pictured the Magnus ALRS cells. And I've noticed that always the cells didn't go directly towards laminaris. They, they made this loop. Obviously designed to keep the timing nearly the same as the crossing. Now, you, of course, would have to get slight differences in the length of the axon uh, that would be the simplest way anyway, to get different positions in space. So the studies that have been published indicate that this one is kept more constant and the crossing one is the one that varies a little bit, but systematically. So the result is a map of the, of the azimuthal plane. Okay, from directly to the left to in, and right in front and then on the other side uh, to the other side. So you get the whole field represented only if you take both nuclei into account. So nucleus lam there is no laminaris in the mammalian brain, but the the superior the lateral superior olive contains cells just like this. But the it was all more theoretical. Uh, it was it was theory for a long time until these and the reason I, I used the chick studies is because that's where they finally were able to pin it down and make measures. It was done by that anatomical study I was telling you about by Javier Marest and at the same time Tom Parks of the University of Utah was studying the physiology of that system in the chicks and together they made a very powerful story. All right. And axons, one of the places these axons project is to the, the tectum of the midbrain. Okay, this is just speculation about how it evolved. You can read it if you're curious about that. There is a second mechanism for sound localization involving uh, in, in mammals, the lateral superior olive, that I say, I think I was supposed to say medial before. Okay. This one's the lateral. And that's responsive to differences in amplitude of the two ears. Because, of course, that's an even simpler way. Obviously, the sound's going to be louder if it's because the head's in the way of the other ear. So there is a slight difference in intensity, too. So that is also used, but it's decoded in the lateral sphere out. And I don't know how that's handled in chicks. Because the study in chicks was focused on that nucleus that they could get to with their electrodes and find it in animal after animal because it was located right dorsally. This is all dors in the dorsal hindbrain of the chick. This is hard to get at in the mammal because it's way down ventrally in the hindbrain. And they're very small nuclei, so it's difficult to do the study in mammals. Okay? And then I mentioned how the owl uses 
different attenuation and different frequencies and how head movements are also. We use head movements a lot. When we hear sound, we, we may not even think about it sometimes, but we make slight movements of the head and we notice that it improves our localization ability. Okay, let's answer these questions. Distinguish between two prominent pathways of the auditory system. The lateral emesis and the breaking of the inferior cortex. So I brought this <laughs> I brought this picture from the visual system chapter. You can see those. Here is the lateral lemniscus. You see the white there. It's a axons coming. They're actually mostly coming from down here. This bump here is the superior olive. Down the bump for the caudal is the inferior olive. Okay. The superior olive is the auditory pathway, okay? And uh, it, it includes the trapezoid body cells here. Okay, and so axons, and, and oh, I should start here. Do you see the cochlear nucleus there? And you see that little, that's a nerve there. Here come the axons, I'll draw an arrow, to the cochlear nucleus. And there you go down to the trapezoid body. And the, the spirit, in the superior olive. And then here, you have pathways going to the inferior colliculus. Some of them end a little before they get there in the nuclei of the trapezoid body. Okay? But they follow that lateral meniscus. And then from there, they follow, I drew it a little too far, I guess, they, they go into that bump. That this is the breaking of the inferior colliculus. Okay? You, you look carefully, you do see deeper shadows on either side. It is a white band there. So we're talking about then lateral aniscus here, breaking the inferior colliculus here in blue. Okay? I've labeled those different components, different colors in that pictures and color in your book. But I wanted you to see that once you learn that anatomy, you can make these things out just looking at the surface of the brain. And that it varies a lot depending on how you adjust the light. So if you're working with another species and you want to get a picture like this, just get a really well fixed brain, you know, clear the surface of all the blood vessels and adjust, play with the light and you end up seeing all these different things. Okay, so here we're, we can see all the auditory system things. I'll put that online with one without the arrows and one with the arrows, okay? And then let's see. Where does information about loca local location of sounds and sights converge in the subcortical structures of the CNS? Where would that be? I was talking about visual, auditory, somatosensory, all in optic tectum or superior colliculus. And then I say, what happens if the auditory and visual maps get out of register? How could that happen? Well, it happens with development. As the head changes size, okay, that happens naturally. If you put prisms on an animal, you cause the visual field to shift. The map of the retina in the tectum doesn't change. What changes is the auditory map. The auditory map is the more plastic one. It shifts so it matches the visual one. Okay? The fascinating finding initially by Mark Kanishi in, in, in owls. Okay? He had prisms on the owls showed this effect. But it, we should have realized that something like that had to be happening in development. It, just, it would be very difficult. It's, it's similar to what the cerebellum does for, for timing and you know, controlling the motor system. But here it's in the sensory system. Okay. So then, in question nine here, I say characterize two separate functions of auditory system pathways ascending through the brainstem. 
how is the separation of these two functions expressed in the inbrain? Even in transcortical particles. Now that requires you to read a lot more in the chapter to get all those parts. But what am I talking about? So the location information is what we were just talking about. That's one of the functions. But what's the other major function? And the pathways are largely different. Identifying auditory stimuli, which is done mainly by patterns. Because it can't be just frequency, right? I mean, if your child's voice changes, you want to still understand him, even though he's talking at a full register below where he used to talk, you know. So we, we always adjust. It, we, we are responding to patterns, uh, not to absolute frequencies, not to... We respond to amplitude changes, and that might be important, but not nearly as important as temple patterns and frequency. Okay. Various kinds of complex frequency modulation. Okay, so... I, I mentioned the experiments on location information, getting to the folliculus. And here, let me just add to that the studies of ablation of superior colliculus. Uh, these were done by me in the hamster, but they've been done extensively in the cat as well. The lesions don't just affect visual orienting. They affect auditory orienting, and they affect more transiently sensory orienting, too. The somatosensory recovers the best even without the colliculus. Why do you think it's just transiently affected, transiently affected? These are diastasis effects. Tectum is big, and it's affecting brainstem mechanisms for orienting as well. So initially, you get the loss of the input from that big tectum. They lose everything. They're amazing animals when they first wake up from the surgery. They can't orient to anything. Then they recover. They pretty soon are responding to their whiskers again. But the endure... Sorry? They're hunched up in a corner, but they are hungry. So the first thing they start responding to is stimulation around the lips. And then they start orienting to touches around the lips, around the mouth. Okay, they will start turning a little bit so they can get a seed you're trying to feed them. Now, these are the hamsters. Big advantages to using hamsters is they're so motivated to get those little seeds, you know. Uh, and they're also a lot cuter than rats and mice. Okay, so <laughs> they're, they're fun, they're fun to study. <laughs> Okay, but the deficits in orienting towards sounds recovers a little bit to lateral replace sounds. There are hindbrain mechanisms that can turn the head in response to sounds even without the tectum. That it's wiped out at the beginning. That then has a slower recovery than the somatosensory orienting, but it recovers. But this orienting to overhead stimulus it's very dependent on the tectum. And they just don't orient to things above them. They can show freezing responses to novel sounds because they're detecting them with the cortex. It's just making those movements that has changed. Okay? And we have a lot of information that, that on the pathways, cortex, location information, auditory uh, localization of sounds does reach the cortex as well. In fact, they've shown distinct cortical regions reached by location information and identification information. They are separate in the cortex. So I, I, I found there's a lot of pictures of this just in recent years, but 
this is a very clear one. Here you have the primary auditory cortex. And then around the auditory cortex, we talk about the, the auditory belt cortex. Okay, and the, the areas here in the rostral belt cortex are the ones sensitive to position. And the projections from there go in the posterior parietal cortex, the same regions that are getting visual. It's not identical regions. They're adjacent regions. But then there are regions of convergence, too. Okay? They don't... The, the picture here doesn't show the convergence. But. And then from these regions, you have the pathways going to the prefrontal cortex. We talked about those in the... Uh, or the visual system earlier. Same thing happens for audition. goes right into those areas of the frontal eye fields. Okay? So it's getting not just visual, but auditory as well. And some of the pathways don't even go through posterior parietal. They, they go directly. Okay? And then, in the rostral belt, auditory belt cortex, you have pathways leading through the superior temporal gyrus to the amygdala and from the temporal pole directly to the ventral prefrontal areas. Okay? Those same areas that themselves project to amygdala and hypothalamus. Okay? So they show here how the visual pathways do a similar thing as we talked about in the visual chapter uh, 22. It was years after the discovery of the visual system pathways like that where people started paying attention to this in the auditory system and this was worked out. Let's talk about auditory pattern detection. We still have a little time. Uh, now we're talking more about dorsal cochlear nucleus. Those are, that's where you have the origins of the most direct pathways that preserve uh, temporal information in the, uh, in the auditory input. And it goes to the main nucleus of the medial geniculate body and from there to the first auditory area primarily. Okay. So when they map auditory cortex by physiology, there are beautiful anatomical maps too. That even the Golgi studies have seen this the way neurons are arranged in the both inferior colliculus and medial geniculate body is a very well organized system. But when you get up to cortex, it's been the physiologists that have dominated the field and now we have a physiologist studying the auditory system, Josh McDermott, here in the department. Okay, and they've mapped these. Initially, they look for the tonotopic maps just like in the cochlear nuclei. We already know that animals can discriminate different frequencies without the cortex, okay? But it's still a good way. So I, I'm asking here, and this question describes several properties that have enabled investigators to distinguish multiple neocortical auditory areas. So the first one is audit frequency differences. Uh, a1 is a good illustration, but if you these are different positions from rostral to caudal, different distances from the posterior supraciliar sulcus. So here's the posterior supraciliar sulcus. Okay, here's the middle supraciliar, and here's the anterior. Okay, so they measure from here, and they go across this cortex in A1. Okay, and when they do that. At each position, they do have, they find multiple best frequencies. That is the frequency where you get the best responses in that neuron. The neuron does respond, though, to other frequencies, too. It's just that it's most sensitive at one frequency. So they use that for these maps. Uh, but you can see that the envelope of, of the points in this kind of graph do show a, a tonotopic map. Okay, it does respond to higher frequencies uh, when you're further from the posterior sulcus. So that's what a tonotopic map is in the auditory system. 
It doesn't mean it's a precise map. It's a, at any one position, you can get a lot of different frequencies. And there is a reason for that. It wants, it's going to, it uses that information from other frequencies. Okay? So, here in the cat, which is by far the best studied animal for auditory system, and Jeff Weiner, who I know and was working with uh, Kent Morris, the guy that did a lot of that work on the, the auditory system at uh, Harvard, and Javeri was his student there. Uh, Weiner worked with Morest in anatomy and then also did a lot of physiology. And this is from one of his review papers. He describes five pontopic maps. Okay, and you see them here. One, two, three, four, five. This light gray area in the picture. They all have this frequency differences when you go from one position to the other. Then there's three non-tonotopic areas. They're the darker gray here. Uh, one in the anterior, this is anterior ectosylvian, uh, and what we call auditory area two. So what does it respond to? Well, just like auditory cortex, it responds to frequency modulation of tones. Okay, and then there's three multisensory areas. So they're not just auditory. They're really association areas. Okay, and they're these. But the auditory system people claim <laughs> that they're really multisensory areas. Okay, the visual areas are here. And unimodal visual areas, association areas are in here. The stride area is in this lateral gyrus. It's very peculiar in the cat. They call it lateral gyrus when it's the most medial gyrus in the hemisphere. It's this gyrus. Okay. And these are the unimodal association areas and then multimodal areas. And then there's two limbic areas. We call it the, the uh, insular cortex. It corresponds to insular in uh, the monkey and human. And this temporal area here. It's areas covering that area where the amygdala is located. But it's neocortical area. It's not part of the amygdala. Okay, they're neocortical areas. Okay. And then I mention here there is separation of input from the two ears uh, in the cortex. And then I ask about ablation effects. I say, how are ablation effects in auditory cortex of the cat related to word deafness after certain cortical lesions in humans? Well, I like to start with the early electrophysiological studies because they're still the best examples of what we mean by pattern selectivity. Let's look at this one. I won't go over all the others, but there, I published some of them in the book. Uh, here they have to one tone. And here's the map of how it responds to single tones. Here's the sound pressure levels. And notice that the minimal amplitude sound, it's responding best at one frequency. here. That's how they map, how they get the tonotopic maps, by mapping single neurons like this. Okay? You can do it with larger electrodes too and, and still get some degree of and notice how it responds to tone on, not to tone off. And it'll do that for a number of different frequencies, but obviously most sensitive here. But now look what happens if you give a tone of changing frequency. Frequency modulation. So it's, you know, it's going and it's responding always to the upward ramp of frequency. Okay? And that's what we mean by temporal sensitivity. Okay, and there's many examples of that. Uh, the, the, some of the examples are more complex, like here's one that always responds to the offset of the tone. Uh, here's one that responds best to short tone, offset of short tones, but to longer tones it responds much more vigorously when the sound goes off. 
This one doesn't respond to the long bursts, but will respond to the short bursts, but only after repeated presentations. So you get a lot of variability, always sensitive to temple patterns. And Whitfield and Evans, who were the first to really comprehensively study this, have a simple model, which I've redrawn here uh, to make it a little clearer, showing that once you have this frequency specificity in the cortex, by having inhibitory interneurons that are asymmetric in between these neurons, you can get, because of the inhibitory pathways, this neuron won't respond well when you're going high to low. But when you're going low to high, the inhibition won't, timing will, will not inhibit those adjacent neurons in time, so you will get responses. And again, of course, you have to assume certain convergence effects in the, the neuron further on in the pathway. But because they don't find neurons like this, output neurons of the thalamus, you do find them in the cortex. We know that it's got to have circuits somewhat like this in, in the cortical area. And it involves these inhibitory interneurons, which, remember, arise in mammals from non-cortical areas in development, but they migrate in. And there's a lot of inhibitory interneurons there in the cortex. Okay, now if you ablate the cortex, you don't get rid of frequency discrimination, but you get profound defects in responses to patterns. You can train them to respond to very simple temporally modulated tones. They fail to, to learn it after you ablate even just A1 or even just the more ventral areas. They have a terrible time. These are highly interconnected areas, so of course you're getting large diastasis effects too. But a lot of these patterns appear to depend on this, these interconnections between these auditory areas. You can use pattern discrimination, you can uh, use responses to novelty and study habituation to novel sounds. You always get the same kind of result. They need the cortex to respond to temporal patterns. So it's like humans with word deafness. Words are, of course, really complex temporal patterns. And uh, humans can become word deaf with uh, cortical lesions and that affect auditory regions. Okay. I point out here another species. Uh, many years ago, there were people, uh, this was Capronica, I believe, at Cornell, studying auditory system of bullfrogs. He found neurons that responded to the splash of another bullfrog entering the water. Talk about a complex pattern. <laughs> that was a really good example. Uh, I tried to find his publication on that and couldn't, but because he talked about it a lot, and we talked about it here at MIT, and he was doing them, I'm sure it was a real finding. But uh, <coughs> there's been studies of squirrel monkeys and macaque monkeys. The squirrel monkey work was earlier. We heard a little bit about that yesterday, from the speaker here. But then in 2008, people found using imaging methods, they found regions in the monkey temple lobe that became active when other monkey voices were heard, uh, but didn't respond to other sounds. Temporal patterns made by monkeys and their sounds is what he's responding to. And they found that it can distinguish that area responded differently to voices of different monkeys they often would uh, they get them to habituate over time it responds less but then a new monkey's voice appears it doesn't have to be louder it can even be softer and suddenly that region responds again so they can detect individual differences I took these quotes from a news report but the, uh, you can find the article in Nature and Mass Science Nikos Logopetis' laboratory, 
Nikos was here working with Peter Schiller for a while on the visual system. So, of course, we postulate that there are units like that in humans that respond selectively to phonemes. We're probably born with them. Although we lose perhaps some of them with development, they're not in our language. And we know about hemispheric differences in humans, too, because of the specialized for dealing with speech in the left hemisphere. Uh, this is also very plastic, so if very early in life a child loses his left hemisphere, if the lesion is early enough, he will develop speech from the right hemisphere. It's very strange, though. If he just has a damaged left hemisphere, this is not in my notes, but just interesting to mention. If a child has damage that affects the left hemisphere, but it's not, it, it has to be totally wipe out the hemisphere to get speech to shift to the right hemisphere. So he'll end up with just bad speech. You know? So one of the treatments for severe problems in children is to actually inflate the entire hemisphere. It sounds horrible, but in fact, the behavioral result is better if they have really bad left hemisphere pathology. I can find <laughs> the lights. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay, we'll skip over the specializations now. We'll mention them a little bit next time. But it's I talk about echolocation a little bit. We saw that in chapter six, the structures that became enlarged in bats and dolphins. Uh, compared with the more visual animals. And then you should learn a little bit about birdsong pathways, especially with Michael Fee here in the building studying birdsong. Uh, and a little, little bit about speech. And, uh, and the pathways are very parallel, though the names are different in, in, in reptiles and birds than they are in mammals. But they have very clear regions of the embryo that are auditory, just like the auditory cortex of the, of the mammal. Okay. So we'll look at that briefly next time.